Absolutely. Well, yeah. trying to take care of y'all. Y'all don't take advantage of it, but that's okay. Some of you don't. All right. We have been talking about the causes leading up to, or the things leading up to, the American Revolution. Things like um, the taxes, the different acts that have been um, imposed upon not only Georgia, but the other colonies as well by Parliament. We have talked about uh, the Declaration of Independence, that document that declares independence, does not give us independence, or it does not give the colonies independence, but it declares their intention. And the war, of course, begins 1775. The Declaration of Independence comes out in 1776. And war eventually makes its way to... Now, I'm going to be honest with you. There's not a lot that happens. You know, we talked about the French and Indian War. What happened in the French and Indian War in Georgia? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. There's not much more that happened during the Revolutionary War in Georgia. Georgia is removed from the fighting. Uh, most of that takes place north of Virginia. Um, Georgia is just, it, it's, it's just there. You know, they don't particularly want independence, and so there's not a lot of fighting that takes place. Um, loyalties are split. We've talked about that before. <coughs> you have loyalists or Tories who are loyal to the king. They remain loyal to the crown, to England. And then you have those who are called patriots or some people might call them Whigs, and that's more of a political designation, a political party. Um, but they support independence. And honestly, in Georgia, there are probably more Tories than there are patriots. But those who are patriots do have a pretty significant impact on the colony, on the state, what becomes the state. 1778, the first military action takes place in Georgia, at least of a significant nature. The British actually um, take Savannah without much of a fight. In fact, I'm pretty sure there's not a, a fight anyway. Um, but the British, if there is one, they win. And on December 29th, they have control of Savannah. Now, why is that important? Why is Savannah so important? Imports, you know. Okay, imports, it is a port city, right? Okay, it's the foundation. It's also the capital of Georgia. It's the colonial capital of Georgia, and so that's important. Um, Augusta is taken by the British a month later, so in January of 1779. And so... Three years, four years into the war, um, not a lot has happened. And when it does, it's pretty severe. It's pretty damaging to the Patriot cause in Georgia. Savannah and Augusta are in British hands. James Cobb wrote this in his little book, Georgia Odyssey, and we haven't used that yet, but we will. Uh, but he wrote regarding the Revolutionary War. War may be a misleading term for the American Revolution as it played out in Georgia, for it implies a degree of organization and structure seldom observed in the 13th colony during the conflict. With Tories in control of Savannah and the Low Country plantation areas, fighting raged in the backwoods where guerrilla activity amounted less to pitched battles and sieges rather than skirmishes, ambushes, lynchings, and cold blooded. Murder. And we're going to talk about some cold-blooded murder. There's some pretty significant people that are involved in murder during uh, the revolutionary period in Georgia. So it's not, you know, we're going to line up 10,000 troops over here, you're going to line up 10,000 troops over here, and we're going to shoot at one another. That's not what you see in Georgia. You see the patriots hanging out in the woods, hiding behind trees, 
jumping out, killing some red coats, and then running off. Yeah, it's it's a lot like more modern warfare. It's a lot like what we saw in Vietnam, more guerrilla type tactics. It's not traditional warfare in Georgia during the Revolutionary War. Now, that looks like it. I doubt very seriously that's the Battle of Savannah, but you do have some nice uniforms there. And you can see how close they are to one another. And you can see somewhat their lines that they would be in. Uh, one of the reasons they do that is because the weapons during the Revolutionary War were terrible. They were smooth bore muskets. And you ever heard the expression, you couldn't hit the broad side of a barn? Well, that was probably very literal with a Revolutionary War musket because you, once you fired it, you really had no idea where the bullet was going. It was going that way, but you really, it was almost luck that you hit where you were aiming. And so what are they doing? They're putting as many bullets into the air as they can from both sides. Uh, they try that during the Civil War, and the difference between a Civil War weapon and a Revolutionary War weapon is you can hit what you're aiming at with a, with a Civil War weapon. And so they went out in these long lines, and the result is over a half a million dead Americans. Thereabouts. Anyway, so what's your point of view? England has supported the colony since the beginning. Some of these colonists are not grateful for that, but I certainly am. You are a loyalist, a Tory. I believe in this battle for independence and am willing to fight for it. You're a patriot. I hope the British troops overwhelm the local untrained militia. You're a loyalist. I was born in England and remain loyal to her. That's pretty obvious. It take, it's time to take a stand. We will no longer pay those taxes imposed on the colonies. Patriot. And then number six, losing Savannah and Augusta to the British is a bad blow, but we must continue to fight. It's a patriot. All right, good. All right, we're not going to do that, so we'll go on. Now, we, we said that not a lot happens in Georgia. One thing that does happen early in 1779 is the Battle of Kettle Creek. Now, it's not a huge battle. It is a relatively small battle. You have roughly um, 1,100, 1,200 men combined fighting in the Battle of Kettle Creek. That's a very small number when you start thinking about how they fought those battles. Um, so it's not a big battle when you start looking at the big picture. It's a very almost insignificant battle. But it is important to Georgia, and it's important to Georgia for three reasons. Number one, it was a morale boost. It, it raised morale. The people of Georgia were discouraged. Savannah has fallen. Augusta has fallen. And so they needed a victory to... to raise um, morale, to, to encourage the people. Not just the people that are fighting, but those who are patriots. Second thing is it gives them um, some supplies that they need. They win, and they're able to, to take all of those British supplies and use them for themselves. And then thirdly, it gave them... Uh, an idea of how they can beat the British. It sets the stage for some victories that will come later. They understand we can't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the British Army. They're too good. They're too powerful. We will lose. And so they figure some things out. Um, Kettle Creek Battleground or Battlefield today is um, still there. It's been preserved right outside of Washington, Georgia, which is Wilkes County. That's near Savannah. It's near the Savannah, or not Savannah, but Augusta, near the Savannah River. Um, you can visit that today. It's about, oh, a mile and a half um, north of this marker and a little bit west. Um, but again, it's a significant battle only in terms of Georgia. 
uh, takes place on February 14th, 1779. So it's not long after Augusta Falls. Remember, uh, Savannah Falls in December of 1778. Um, Augusta Falls in January of 79. And then the Battle of Kettle Creek takes place in February of 79. Two people. Um, there are actually four commanders, but two that, that we'll mention here. Elijah Clark. Yep, you probably have. Elijah Clark and Thomas Dooley are heading up the Georgia troops. They're commanding the Georgia troops. Um, and instead of going toe-to-toe with the British, they surprised them. They attacked them. Um, when they are least expecting it. I think it was either very early in the morning or late at night that they actually um, attacked the British loyalists. Um, It's probably closer to 700 British um, compared to about 360 Georgia troops. Um, And again, it, it is a huge victory and it comes about because of the tactics that are used by Elijah Clark and Thomas Dooley and others. So they're able to defeat the British at Battle Creek, or Kettle Creek rather, Battle Creek's in Michigan. Um, Kettle Creek is where they make cereal, by the way. General Mills. Kellogg's, Battle Creek, Michigan. Frosted Flakes, making y'all hungry, aren't I? All right. Elijah Clark, we just mentioned, um, is one of the heroes of the Battle of Kettle Creek, but there's also another man that we will mention. His name is Austin Dabney. And unlike Elijah Clark, he is not a commander. He's just a soldier. But he becomes one of the heroes of Kettle Creek. He fights under Elijah Clark. Elijah Clark is his commanding officer. Um, And these two are about as different as people can be, but yet they are two of the heroes of this particular battle. Um, Map on the left is actually from the Civil War Trust, which is now the American Battlefield Trust. And one of the things they do, in fact, their primary objective is to preserve battlefields in America from um, the French and Indian War all the way up through the Civil War. Um, And you can see what happens here. you got Dooley, Pickens, and Clark, um, and they basically are able to surround the British, and then they're able to drive them away. They're able to drive them away. Um, and because of that, they're able to capture all of the stuff that the British left behind. Because when you retreat, you don't take your stuff with you. You're just trying to get out. Um, about, dad gummit, about 450 British troops are either killed or captured along again with all their stuff. So um, the American Battlefield Trust, they purchased all that land in blue. Um, there's a private organization called the Battle, or excuse me, the Kettle Creek um, Battlefield Association. They own the land that's in brown, and then the green is actually public land. It's owned by the state of Georgia. Um, so you might ask, why do they try to preserve American battlefields? Um, it's part of history. And, I mean, you're talking, you know, places like Gettysburg. Yorktown, um, all of those places that we, if you haven't heard about them, you will. And they're, they're important in telling the story of what happened. Um, you can see on the map on the right, there's not a lot that happens in Georgia. They, they identify eight battles. Um, I'm not sure that any of them were full-fledged battles, except for maybe this one. And we call it not the Battle of Savannah, but the Siege of Savannah. If we're going to put something under siege, what are we going to do? 
We're not going to destroy it. We're going to surround it. And we're not going to let stuff in or out. And so eventually what's going to happen? Well, what are they going to eat eventually? They're, they're, they eat each other. Animals. Y'all are sick. People. They're, they're friends. They're supplies. Meat. Eventually they're going to have to surrender because there's nothing to eat. Oh. And remember, this is not just soldiers. This is civilians. Civilians aren't going to last as long as the soldiers do. They're going to want to give up in a hurry. So... The siege of Savannah is not really a siege. Um, it happens in October 1779. The French have come to help because the Americans have scored a big victory at Saratoga. Saratoga um, in New York. And because of that, the French decide they will help, that these Americans do have a chance. And so they help. Um, and so in 1779 in October, um, not quite a year after the British have taken Savannah, the Americans try to take it back. They attack Savannah. They ultimately surround Savannah um, in hopes of taking it back. The French are under control of Count Charles Henri de Estaing. He is a, an admiral um, in the French Navy. He's controlling the Savannah River. There are also French and American troops on land. Battle only lasts 90 minutes. 90 minutes. That's, you know, that's a movie. A short movie, but it's a movie, right? When you go to the theater, you might, you know, it might be two hours, but, you know, around 90 minutes. During that 90 minute period, 800 French and American troops are killed compared to 18 for the British. Now, use your math. Was that a big victory for the British? Yes. Yeah. And that's not casualties. That's people that were actually killed because a casualty, when we're talking about a battle, um, casualties are those who are killed, those who are wounded, those who are captured, and those that run away. In other words, we can't find them. Don't know what happened to them. Um, and so out of the number of British or American and French troops you have j killed, not casualties, but killed, is 800. Now, you start looking at Civil War battles and like the Battle of Antietam, which was one day, um, there were close to 30,000 casualties. So we're not talking nearly the number of people that we see in the Civil War, but that's significant. 90 minutes. One of the people that um, is killed is a man named Count Casimir Pulaski. He's Polish. He has come from Europe. He's come from Poland to fight with the Americans. Um, he's been there quite a while, a couple of years. He actually saves the life of George Washington at Brandywine. Uh, Washington is about to be captured, and Pulaski brings in the cavalry, um, and Washington's able to escape. Um, so Pulaski becomes one of Washington's favorite. He falls out of favor, he's sent south to Georgia. Um, and is killed at the Siege of Savannah. Now, he's also known as the father of American cavalry. Cavalry back in that day, they rode what? Horses. Today, they would drive tanks, cavalry. Okay, Anything that's mounted would be cavalry. So, a couple of interesting things about good old Casimir. And in fact, um, what I'm about to tell you may be the most disturbing thing you hear all day. It may be the most interesting thing you hear all day. In fact, I think it is. And I don't know what y'all have heard today. But I guarantee you, it's not nearly as interesting and or disturbing as what I'm about to tell you. You ready? No? Okay. Casimir Pulaski is five feet tall. Same. Okay. He's the height. 
but he's he's not a big five feet tall. He's not filled out. He's very slight. Oh, that's Ethan. That's okay. me. Well, I would not be so quick to uh, to start saying that because what we've discovered about Casimir Pulaski is that uh, more than likely, Casimir Pulaski was intersex. He had physical characteristics of both males and females. Nope, that ain't me. Okay. And why do we know that? Well, let's talk about what we definitely know. Um, Pulaski is mounted on horseback. There are some French troops that have been overrun. He's trying to rally them. He's trying to push them forward to continue to, continue to fight the British. Um, there's grape shot that is shot out of a cannon, and think of a really big shotgun, and, and you get an idea of what grape shot is. Um, it's several, several projectiles that would be shot out of a cannon, kind of like a shotgun. He's wounded. He dies a couple of days later. Um, he's buried in Savannah. And in the 1990s, I think it was 1996, they disinter Casimir Pulaski because they need to rebuild his, um, his crypt where he was buried. And when they begin to examine the bones of Casimir Pulaski, they come to a startling revelation. It's not the bones of a man that are in that particular crypt. It's the bones of a woman. Now, you might think, well, there's no difference between male and female skeleton. Ah, but there is. And one of the primary differences is the fact that women have broader hips. Why do women have broader hips? Because they're thick. Nope. <laughs> think. Think biology for a minute. Women do what that men can't do? Birth, birth, birth. Wait. They give birth. They carry children and they give birth. So therefore, they have broader hips. And when they began to examine this skeleton, they realized this skeleton has hips that belong to a woman. Her skull, or the skull of Casimir Pulaski, as they looked at it, was more delicate than a typical male skull. And so... They thought, you know, what's going on here? Um, there was a, a, not really a decision, but there was the thought that this is not actually the skeleton of Casimir Pulaski. And that makes sense, right? It's a woman. If it's a woman, it can't be Casimir Pulaski. But good old DNA came about. They actually were able to collect DNA from a direct descendant of Casimir Pulaski. And when they did, they discovered the skeleton is actually the skeleton of Casimir Pulaski. He was simply um, what is called intersexed. Now, we don't know if it was just, no, we don't know if it was just skeletal or if he had male and female genitalia. We, we don't know. Obviously, you know, any soft tissue, muscle, skin, um, organs have long since decayed and gone away. Um, now, why do I tell you that? Just because it's interesting. And it's kind of disturbing. Well, it is interesting. Bibbidi oh. boobidal. Shh. How about using good sense? 240 years ago. And the search to learn if the bones of Casimir Pulaski really is, it led to a shocking discovery. A documentary aired tonight talks about the revelation and how people locally here in Chicago feel about the fact that the father of the American Cowboy may have been intersex. Oh. Julie Underwood has more on this discussion. Well, it's not making the difference in this particular case. Well, the Smithsonian Channel actually attempted to unravel the mystery that started over 20 years ago. Bones were exhumed in Georgia, and one day before they examined, Here's really a bad joke. They weren't those belonging to the Polish patriot at all. They were a woman. A closer examination years later and subsequent DNA tests proved that Casimir Pulaski, a man credited with saving George Washington's life, may have possessed physical traits of both a man and a woman. A secret until now. 
Scientists and historians are struggling to resolve a tantalizing mystery. Tonight, the Smithsonian Channel aired a one-hour story on Casimir Pulaski, a Polish-American patriot often referred to as a war hero. It's entitled, The General Was Female? This revolutionary war hero may not have been who he thought he was. The story dwelled little on his revolutionary war accomplishments. The topic fixated on whether the five-foot-tall man was actually a man or a woman. The inference? Pulaski had physical traits of both sexes. He was intersex. Could that explain why the father of the American cavalry had female-looking features? I hope it doesn't change anybody's opinion on it because his significance in history is there. It doesn't matter if he was a, a, a female or a male. He's, he's a Polish and American hero, and that will not change anything. At the Polish Museum of America in Chicago, no one's upset over the scientific exploration. They're simply curious about the results and wonder why anyone would bother investigating the gender of the general nearly 250 years following his death. Why they did it, I don't know, but it doesn't change you. The first date started in 1996, Savannah, Georgia. That's where Pulaski died in battle. A monument there containing his bones was crumbling. When locals went to fix it, they took a closer look at what was inside. Oh, Dr. Mess, you just have to shoot me. It's a woman. It's not Pulaski. Small in stature, a petite pelvic cradle. Yeah. I would agree. I would agree. This is a very, very feminine pelvis. And a smaller skull with delicate features from a general who never married, was antisocial with troops, and was happy to dish out orders, but didn't take them well. Is that, along with scientific conclusions, Enough to say Casimir Pulaski had physical traits of both a man and a woman. What tells us is that we don't know about people's personal lives, who they are, what their biology is, and that doesn't make, it really doesn't make any difference. He was a hero, he's still a hero, he's revered by the Polish community, and he's revered by Americans for being a war hero. And that doesn't take anything away from he is, he, she, her. Our community activists suggested this information about the property of the property years ago. They were exploring us in some way, but today the climate is so different. The chairman of the museum admitted he's no scientist, but he felt the program seemed a bit inconclusive on this front. And some people might be curious to learn more, some don't care at all. 240 plus years. So here's the here's the question. Does it really matter? No. Not at all. It's just one of those oddities that we find in history from time to time um, that really have no explanation um, or might have several explanations. We, we don't know. So Casimir Pulaski um, actually is still celebrated in the United States particularly in Illinois. Um, school children get his birthday out of school. Can we? No. When is I don't know. Um, and again, another neat thing is in 2009, he was granted U.S. citizenship. What does that mean? It means he was made a U.S. citizen. But he was dead. And there's only eight people that have been given that particular distinction, honorary U.S. citizenship. Um, in other words, words, they don't have to go through the process of, of becoming a citizen. They're just made a citizen. All right, here's Pulaski's death or when he was um, shot. Um, Fort Pulaski, which is down near Tybee Island, is named after Casimir Pulaski, if you've ever wondered. Um, it's a fort built in the 1830s by, believe it or not, Robert E. Lee. All right. So the siege of Savannah, of course, fails, in case you didn't figure that one out. And Savannah remains under the control of the British until 1782. Um, and that is when James Wright leaves Savannah for the final time. Um, he had spent most of the war in Savannah. And, uh, of course, Georgia's primarily under control of the British. As we start looking at different battles, um, this is the second bloodiest battle of the Revolutionary War. 
And in that, we would count death, and we would count those that were wounded. We would count those who were captured and those who simply vanished, disappeared. Um, and, and based on that, it's the second bloodiest battle of the Revolutionary War. Um, this is a map of fortifications and positions around Savannah. This is drawn by hand, which it, it's really good because um, military officers had to know how to draw. They had to know how to do things like this so that they could pass um, accurate information along to people that needed it. So in the 1800s, when West Point begins, when the Naval Academy is established, one of their courses or part of their coursework had to do with art and being able to draw, uh, which is pretty neat. We don't think about Army officers being able to draw. But, well, I don't think so because... You know, we got GPS and all that stuff. But um, anyway, we have drones. You can just send one out and look at the battlefield, right? All right, so that's the end of the Revolutionary War. Treaty of Paris comes along in 1783. Of course, Yorktown, Cornwallis, General Cornwallis is captured um, by General Washington there at Yorktown, and that ends the Revolutionary War. Officially, it ends with the Treaty of Paris, of 1783, not the Treaty of Paris of 1763, but 1783. Remember, there is a difference. 63 ends what war? Oh, Revolutionary. No. French and Indian War. French and Indian. 83 ends the Revolutionary War. And this is the document that actually gives the United States her independence from England. Because the only nation in the world that uses the masculine pronoun is Germany. Yeah. Or I don't know that they do anymore, but it used to be known as the fatherland. Germany. Yeah. It's like, um, you know, a ship is typically referred to as a her. A nation is typically referred to as a her. It takes on the um, the feminine pronoun. All right. This is actually the, the uh, signature page of the Treaty of Paris. You can see John Adams and Benjamin Franklin's uh, signatures there. Don't know who the other two are. Probably British. Um, so yes or no? Were the loyalists allied with the British? Yeah. Were the loyalists allied with the British? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Was the Battle of Kettle Creek an American defeat? No. Was the Siege of Savannah the bloodiest battle in the Revolution? No. no. It was the second. Were the French allied with the British during the Siege of Savannah? No. Did the Treaty of Paris of 1783 give America independence from England? Yes. All right. So we're going to try to talk about three people real quickly. Um, and if not, we'll talk about two and get to the third one on Monday. Some heroic Georgians. This is Elijah Clark. Elijah Clark uh, begins the war fighting the Creek and the Cherokee Indians. Um, and he learns really um, how to best fight the British by fighting the Creeks and the Cherokee. He learns that guerrilla warfare is much more effective um, when you're in the back country, it's much more effective when you're fighting a numerically superior group of people. And, and that's been historically proven time and time again as we look at other wars. Um, and so Clark leads a small group of soldiers who, instead of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the British, they attack them using surprise. Uh, they ambush them. They go in at night because nobody fights at night, but they go in at night. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they use what are called guerrilla tactics. Not gorilla, but guerrilla. Um, 1781, he's part of, the, um, part of the soldiers that recapture Augusta right at the end of the war. Um, and he is a, he's a pretty tough character. He, he, of course, fights the loyalists. 
He is wounded on many occasions. Um, he contracts smallpox. He contracts the mumps and survives all of that to become one of the leaders in early Georgia um, and in the early history of Georgia as a state. Rather dashing looking young man. Got a crooked nose. But other than that, um, so his physical makeup, he has a strong physical makeup. All right. Now, this is Austin Dabney, and you couldn't have found two people more different. Elijah Clark, of course, is white. Austin Dabney is black. Um, Austin Dabney is a slave who actually fought under Elijah Clark. Elijah Clark is not his owner. Um, Austin Dabney has actually been sent to fight in the place of his owner, of his master. He is a substitute. And from what we know, first of all, Austin Dabney is wounded during the Battle of Kettle Creek. Uh, but from what we know, he is the only African American to fight in the Battle of Kettle Creek. And, and there were um, several, several um, African Americans that fought in the Revolutionary War. Um, here is a, this is probably a doctoral thesis. Uh, actually, no, it's published by the Daughters of the American Revolution. But it is um, it's entitled Black Courage, Documentation of Black Participation in the American Revolution. So there, and this is basically just a list of people who fought in the American Revolution who were African American. Um, this is um, Negro, the Negro in the American Revolution, kind of an old book, um, but it mentions... Austin Dabney um, broke his thigh at the Battle of Kettle Creek. To break your thigh, you remember that's the biggest bone in the American in, in the body in the human body. Um, so he is actually um, in the artillery, and he is wounded. Um, survives that wound. And let's see what happens to old Austin. Do, 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 do. Well, Austin is wounded. He is cared for by a man named Giles Harris, who's a fellow soldier. After the war, he actually goes and lives with the family, with Giles Harris and his family. Um, in 1786, the General Assembly of Georgia granted Austin Dabney his freedom. And not only do they give him his freedom, they give him land, which makes him, in 1786, one of the wealthiest African Americans in Georgia, if not the wealthiest, simply because he owned land. Might not have had any money, but he had land. Um, and you can see there, Austin Dabney dies in 1830. Um, he's only 12, well, 14 years old in 1779 when the Battle of Kettle Creek takes place. 14, 13, 14 years old. Yeah, he's very young. Um, 1765 to 1830, he dies in 1830. Um, born in 1765. So you do the math. He's about 14 years old. All right. Now, um, what you see here is the document that gave Austin Dabney property. You can see his name, um, the petition of Austin Dabney, and then a lot of stuff that is hard to read. But you get down to 50 acres of land as a bounty for his service, as a reward for his service. Um, and it was given to him in Washington County. Now, if you know where Washington County is today, it looked much different in 1786. It was bigger. 
um, and it's since been broken up into smaller counties. So somewhere east of the Oconee River is where um, Austin Dabney's land was. Uh, this is his document giving him his freedom, an act by the Georgia General Assembly. Now, this is my favorite character. This is one of my favorite heroes in all of Georgia history, Nancy Hart. First of all, she's six feet tall. She's redheaded. She had to be cross-eyed. Um, she was brash. She was, she spoke her mind. She um, was an angry woman and mean. And again, she cussed like a sailor. What she is known for, and we don't actually know if it's history or it's mythology or it's legend, but I think there's probably a bit of all three of those mixed together, and it gives us this, the story of Nancy Hart. The story is that six British loyalists came to her door, and they demanded to be fed and quartered. Um, she ultimately agrees. She initially turns them down. She ultimately agrees, brings them in her house, um, kills her one remaining turkey, and begins to prepare them a meal. Um, she provides them with some alcohol as well. And being soldiers, they sat there and they drank the alcohol. And as they were drinking and as they began to eat, Nancy Hart is taking their weapons. And she is hiding them. And they finally realize what's going on. They charge Nancy Hart. She shoots one of them, kills him outright, shoots another one, wounds him. He ultimately dies. And so this woman kills two soldiers outright. Um, she had managed to contact her husband. Um, he um, ultimately comes back home. He wants to shoot him again and get rid of them, and she says, no, let's hang them instead. So she and her husband hang the other four loyalist soldiers in their um, apple orchard. Well, he ain't right, is he? No. He definitely ain't right. Now, there is a little video that I'm going to show you, but we don't have time to finish it, so I'm going to stop right there. Um, but let me let me do say this. In fact, let me go ahead to the next, next slide, and then we'll come back to the video on Monday. Um, so the, the story is that Nancy Hart shot and killed two English soldiers and that she and her husband hanged the remaining four. So the soldiers were hanged and buried on her property. All six were buried on her property. In 1912, there are railroad workers working on the property that had once belonged to the Hart family. And as they're digging, they uncover six skeletons. And those six skeletons, along with their skeletal remains, you have... Um, buttons from British uniforms. You have um, weapons that uh, were buried with them. So we're pretty sure that the story of Nancy Hart is true. Uh, what we also know about Nancy Hart is she was a spy. What would make her so effective as a spy? She's a woman, and people wouldn't expect women to be involved in that. She also is thought to have fought in the Battle of Kettle Creek. Because she was such a large woman, she could easily disguise herself as a male. And she fought in the Battle of Kettle Creek. Now, we, we don't know if that's true, but we do know there were six skeletons that were uncovered on her property. We know that she was a spy. So I think it's probably safe to assume that she also fought in the Battle of Kettle Creek disguised as a man. And that was not all that unusual. 
Um, you, you had women who actually went to war with their husbands and ended up fighting. Um, so anyway, so we'll, we'll watch the little video Monday. That's what we'll start with. And uh, we'll finish this on up. Thank you. See you Monday. Yep, buddy. See you Monday. Thank you, sir.